as loud this morning as you're used to to cover up all your murmurings. <laughs> all right, let's stand and sing number 125. We'll start off in the blue book. 125, Jesus Paid It All. saved and for everybody that is saved lord that uh, that can still cleanse us and keep us close to you in our fellowship or thank you for the blood being able to purge our conscience from dead works and being able to give us the forgiveness of sins even after we're saved so we can have a close relationship with you lord I ask you please bless the singing this morning lord I ask you please uh, bring your spirit in here this morning that you would meet with us that you'd speak to hearts this morning uh, we've heard enough of the world's noise, and for an hour or so this morning, Lord, I ask that you help us to hear from you and help us to be pleasing to you in our heart with the decisions we make, with our mind. And Lord, I ask that you please bless the preaching this morning and the singing, everything done here, that it would be glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. How about 326? 326. More about Jesus. Amen. 326. Oh 
298. Sing one more, 298, surely goodness and mercy. So two, Wrong number. 192. You're all giving me the same look at the same time. <laughs> uh, 292. 292. All right, we're going to sing the whole song. So just, I'm just going to tell you now, we're just going to sing the whole song. Most of you know that. But we'll sing uh, just the first page. And we'll sing just the first page again, and then the third verse we'll sing all the way to the end. So just follow along, stand on your toes where you have to, and we'll hit all those high notes. All right. <laughs> all pilgrim was I end of one dream. open in a new GPS location, so you should all know where that is. If you don't, who's the nursery worker for today? All right, talk to her. That's Miss Anna. Talk to Anna if you need to take anybody to the nursery. If you need to be there, that's fine. If you can leave your kids, that's preferable. Uh, you came here to hear some preaching. I let the nursery workers do their jobs, and uh, you can do what the Lord brought you here this morning to do. All right. Good morning. Good morning. It's almost like I haven't been here for a while. Yeah. Okay, uh, this morning, announcements. Kids are at camp. Um, I believe they made it. They had some, they had some uh, issues with the car yesterday, but they, they're good to go. Um, September, so a couple months from now, we're having a, a uh, pottery ministry or a pottery gathering. Or something like that but we're going to be making and that's going to be here right yep. we're going to be doing pottery here and uh, next Saturday we're going to be doing street preaching um, 
We meet at the, cor uh, the corner of 24th and King, and we park in the um, City Brew parking lot, and then head on over. So, and that's at one o'clock, right? One. And um, next week, I'll have an announcement as to what we're going to be doing with door knocking and lists. So we have to make that determination. Is there anything I missed? No. Okay, Pastor. Go ahead. Wait. Some fresh chard. Anybody wants some after church? I have bags. I'll bring them inside. Yeah. Say it again. Some fresh chard from our garden this oh, morning. Oh, fresh chard. <laughs> See the ladies. I thought that was a fish, but I guess it's come from a <laughs> garden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're missing Abby, we're missing Beth this morning, Scarlett went there, um, and Grace, Adriana, and Faith, so keep them all in prayer for camp. We made it to Missoula, and then I think they're going to borrow a different vehicle, because the one they drove is acting up a little bit, so uh, they're in church today, and then they're going to try this afternoon and have an evening service at camp, so in Coast Falls. So keep them in prayer, continue to travel in there. Please keep all the teens in prayer, that the Lord would speak to them, they'd be willing to hear. And uh, my kids come back from camp every year. Uh, Abby's gone twice now, this is Scarlett's first year, but they come back every year with a different uh, perspective on the world, on life, uh, meet some new friends, they have a different attitude, and it's always a good thing. So I'm in prayer for them, that they would uh, hear some preaching. Please pray for the preachers there as well. Those are some of the best preachers that I know, and I'm not just saying that because they are also my friends, but uh, they're from out west. They preach different than people from back east, and they speak to my heart differently, the different parts of the country. I love hearing a good old rip-roaring hack preacher from down in Georgia. I love it. It just doesn't feed my soul like somebody from Montana who's uh, kind of rough and tough and been through troubles and not trying to hide it. And then up north, I love that kind of preaching too. You know me, I have kind of a spreadsheet mentality, so I don't mind the dry sermons as long as there's substance to it. And I'll add my own water uh, like I do on the campsite. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I like to hear a different variety of preaching, and those kids are hearing some of the best preachers in this area. Um, so, so keep the preachers in prayer too for their messages, that they can uh, speak what the Lord gave them, that they can uh, connect with the kids there be some decisions, some good decisions made for the Lord in that, in that time. Very special, very important time. How many of you went to camp when you were kids? You had a church camp or some kind of camp that you went to? Um, I can still think of, uh, the reason I'm probably uh, in Montana today is because of a camp. Uh, this is in my Christian high school, and uh, so I can tell my testimony so I don't get to preach today. I went to, uh, in 12th grade, I went to a Wilds camp associated with Bob Jones University. Uh, I'll correct Bob Jones University when they correct the Bible, and I'll thank them and appreciate them when they gave me the Bible and gave me the truth. And uh, I can take both sides and be their friend and be their brother in Christ and, and love them, and they can deal with me. But uh, uh, the Wilds Campground uh, is still in operation today in a couple places in the country, but we went on the East Coast. I don't remember what state it's in, North or South Carolina probably. And... Uh, uh, preacher there, I don't remember who he is, but I think I have some notes from his sermon somewhere. Uh, he said, how many of you would surrender to full-time Christian service if the Lord would call you to that? So I raised my hand, said, I'm willing to do what the Lord would call me to do. And service ended, he said, go get by yourselves for, I forget what amount of time, 5, 10, 15 minutes, and, uh, and you just be in prayer with the Lord. So the whole place broke up, just spread out all over the camp. Meet back in 15 minutes with your own group, with your uh, with the high school class. Probably by the flagpole out there, first place that caught my attention when I walked out the door, sat down by the flagpole. I said, I don't know how this works. I don't know what to do. I tell people all the time, you need to get an answer from the Lord. And then the other end of the phone is silent. And in conversation, I say, what does the Lord want you to do? Well, I think I should do this, and I want to do that, and I just think that this is the right thing, and my dad wants me to do this. Yeah. You miss the whole thing. <laughs> and at that age, you don't, you don't know, you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. So I didn't know what that meant. I thought, I don't know how, how this works, how to find out, but I just surrender to do if I'm supposed to do it or not. So I said, I don't know anything else to do except pray, and then I prayed for a couple minutes, opened my Bible, said, well, I guess I'll pick up where I left off this morning. Psalm 82, in that morning, 
Romans. I read Psalm 83, and the last, I didn't even know what the chapter was about. It's a really cool chapter, Psalm 83, but the last verse stuck out to me, that men may know that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art the most high over all the earth. The Lord gave me that verse there, and I said, is that what you're calling me to do, that men may know? It doesn't mean that you have to go to Billings, Montana and be a pastor, but that is what that meant to me. And the Lord will speak to you if you give him an opportunity to speak. You know how the Lord can speak to you today? Through this guy in a white shirt over here. That's how the Lord can speak to you today, if he so chose to do so. He said, I don't believe in circumstances. The Lord could use circumstances to speak to you. And if you think God can't use circumstances, then, then you're going to have a rough road to hoe. I don't even like hoeing at all, but <laughs> worse, if you can't take a hint from God putting circumstances in your life and, and circumstantial things that get your attention. And God can use another man in conversation, he can use a preacher, he can use the Bible, he can speak to you in prayer. And if you come to me every Sunday and say, God showed me this in prayer, God's telling me, God's speaking to me, I'm going to be suspicious of you. But I don't think that God is limited and he can't speak to you in prayer where to draw the line. I just know some of you make me suspicious when you tell me that all the time. I don't think you're hearing from the Lord. And I don't know how you can know the difference. But you need to figure out the difference and it won't contradict the book. That's the first thing. So if the Lord is speaking to you about something today, then, uh, then why don't you listen to what he has for you to say? If the Lord speaks to you through this preaching today, then why don't you put aside everything else and all your foolish thinking and all the friends and all the things of this world and all your plans and directions and say, Lord, I'm willing to go where you want me to go. I'm willing to stop where you want me to stop. I'm willing with your help to do the things and get on the right track and on the right course that you have set for me. And if you get off of that course, the Lord will help you. The will of God is not a straitjacket. The will of God is the leading of a shepherd. The will of God is not a list of do's and don'ts. The Christian life is not keeping the fundamentals of the faith. I keep I think all the fundamentals of the faith, there's only like eight or ten of them. I believe all of them. I'd like to add a couple to the list. How about love one another? Is that one of the fundamentals of the faith? I never hear that one preached on. I never hear that. Maybe somebody has. I hope they hope some church has that figured out. Let's add that one to the end of the list. The, the, the following the Lord is not list, listing a bunch of do's and don'ts and following those. Following the Lord is listening to the shepherd's voice and letting him lead and guide you. Shepherds in Montana do not get behind their sheep and drive them with a whip like they do cattle. They get ahead of them, and they speak to them, and they lead them, and the sheep follow the shepherd's voice. And when they get out of line, then they throw a rock above their head, or then they get behind them, and they push them back, or if they get stuck, they pick them up. But that's the exception, right? The way you lead sheep is you get in front of them, and you follow the sheep follow the shepherd's voice. All right, brother, if there's any time left, I'll have you <laughs> Welcome to Bible Baptist Church. If you haven't been here before, uh, stick around for a minute. Some people like to dart out the door. I, my wife will catch you, but she's not here today, so please don't dart out the door. I need every opportunity I can get to say hi, shake your hand one more time, and uh, glad that you're here this morning. If you do need kids uh, taken next door, we got the nursery available, and then I'm going to turn over the rest of the time to you, Brother Ruth, and whatever the Lord leads you, you bring this morning. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, well, if the Lord doesn't speak to you through me, there was quite a bit there in the introduction to uh, speak to you. Amen. Yeah. That was good. That was really good. Glad to see that it was spoken with uh, from some experience. Um, anyway, g- good morning again, and I just want to say a few words before we get into the message. I know this is a Sunday morning, and we, you know, um, I, I in, in Ukraine, I preach an hour. I preach an hour kind of minimum, and whenever it gets good, it's probably about an hour and 15 minutes, and I'm still trying to figure out how to do things a little bit different here, okay? So so I'm not going to be be hard on you this morning, and uh, it just takes longer to say things in Russian than it does in English, and the words are, you know, it's long. You know, over here you say barber, over there you say parikmakarskaya, and you know, so it just takes long. So um, anyway, I uh, just want to say a couple of words. What we want to uh, sing a special. This is something that uh, we've been trying to work on as a family, is that uh, to sing. And um, 
And then tonight, Lord willing, would like to show you some slides of our ministry. Uh, we are the Rue family, and uh, we've been serving the Lord now in Ukraine for going on uh, 28 years. Um, as far as I know, we were the first to step foot in Ukraine in 1992 and in search of the Lord's will. And uh, the Lord made it very plain to me in 1992, July, actually this month, on July 4th, 1992. That's when uh, the Lord directed me from Bulgaria to go to Ukraine. And, uh, you know, we just, I was thrilled to find, finally, the will of God for my life as far as where to serve. And um, so we've been there ever since. We were kind of kamikazes for Christ, I say, because I graduated on a Friday night, got to preach in the Bible Baptist pulpit Saturday, um, had a Sunday like normal, and then Monday I got married after being engaged for a month, after only really dating for two weeks, and so within six weeks, we just kind of went. We knew it was the Lord was in it, and I don't recommend that, okay? I'm just saying, we were doing a lot of fasting, a lot of praying, and it just is the Lord was in it, okay? I don't want any young people to say, well, Brother Rue, you know, <laughs> no, that was just kind of a special dispensation of grace, okay? <laughs> so uh, we just, we had maybe uh, 10 meetings, I think. We really, we had maybe... I think it was around $800 a month promised. It wasn't even coming in. And with what we had uh, from our wedding, everybody gave us a bunch of money on our wedding. I said, ah, this ought to be enough. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we went and uh, began to minister to a society and to a people that had to uh, try to pick up the pieces of a culture and a country after 70 years of communism and socialism. And... Uh, oh, you know, we'll talk, I'll show you the pictures tonight. I won't go into all that. I'll just have to tell you that uh, the Lord is sufficient, and His Word is certainly is sufficient, and the Lord's good. Um, anyway, we're the Roof family. I'm going to show you the slides tonight and talk about the ministry. We're here for uh, what is called deputation, kind of slash furlough. Uh, coming back for furlough for me has always meant to try to do a little bit of deputation along the way. And not having done deputation at the very beginning really caught up to us around the years uh, 2003, where we just couldn't make it anymore. And so the Lord, um, you know, trying to... You might have to explain those two words. Deputation? And furlough. And furlough. I, okay. Um, you know, deputy, the word deputy, it's not associated just with Barney Fife, okay? I'm, I'm a deputy, you know? <laughs> And uh, kind of, so to speak, I go around to churches, and I'm being deputized. And what that means is I am looking for people who will uh, kind of get, a lot, get on board with what the Lord has uh, called us to do. And what that means, it's a system of deputizing. That is, churches deputize someone to go in their stead to a mission field. Okay, and you know, it's kind of like with Barney Fife, you give me a couple bullets along the way. <laughs> but anyway, it's called deputation, and that's where we go from the, the, the uh, work of raising your own support, both prayer and financial support, is on the missionary. And so what that means is we have to set aside, a you know, time to travel and go from church to church, and uh, we give our ministry, give our burden, show uh, the Lord's call, and then churches pray, and according to their ability, they either say, no, it's a system that works out mostly, should anyways, work out the guys that truly aren't called. Because usually, if you're not called, I mean, who wants to do that? You know, just live from, you know, Sunday to Wednesday, travel from state to state, and raise your kids in a van. I mean, who really wants to do that? You know, I, I like to live in a house with deep roots, you know, I like stability. And so usually people that aren't called aren't going to do it. And so it's called deputation. Furlough is when you come back to the States after being on the field and you're just really tweaky. <laughs> you're just, really, <laughs> just, okay, it's time for a break. And you begin to lose your identity. I've, you know, now, officially, I've spent more, uh, over half of my life in Ukraine than I have in the United States. And so I have to come back and kind of learn what it means to be an American because now you guys are starting to look strange to me. You know, it's just, it's, it, it gets that way. Yeah. My kids were raised there, uh, born there, raised there. My wife passed me up as far as half of her life uh, quite a few years ago. And so we come back, and that gives the churches a chance to uh, get to know us again. Uh, churches, if they're normal, you know, like our work in Ukraine, I feel like I've pastored four churches over the years. 
Uh, and the same thing here, just the body of Christ, it breathes in and it breathes out. You know, people come and they go. And churches, over time, I was talking to Brother um, Dr. Peacock, and he said, Brother Rue, I really want you to come by. He said, because, uh, man, he says, my church is totally different than what it was the last time you were through. And so we had one church not too long ago. Um, we hadn't seen them in 17 years. And they supported us faithfully all these years, having not seen us. And there was only about two or three people left from the original group. So we come back so that uh, saints can get to know us and we can give a report on what the Lord's done. And you're, it's, it's called you're supposed to rest. Uh, furlough, you're supposed to rest. And uh, I would have to say in the past we'd always come off, you know, get off the plane and hit the ground running. And this time we really did because we had a rough, this past term uh, was almost seven years, and it was probably the roughest and the worst. I thought that we had been through things in the past, but it wasn't like this. And so I did. I came back, I guess his brother, um, Owen, Papua New Guinea. Um, but brother Mullins, he says when his wife gets a little bit, you know, weird, he says, you're getting bushy, you know, because you're starting to act like the people in the bush, you know. <laughs> and so we were getting a little bit bushy. And came back and was just had that Ukrainian chip on my shoulder. I'm ready to throw down with anybody, anytime. I did not wear my mask over my nose on the plane. <laughs> and nobody said anything to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of one of those things, reviving. And uh, so it's been really good just to decompress, to be around God's people. And uh, so anyway, uh, that's what we're here to do when we go from church to church. And it's like, what has happened? I've known Brother Drake for probably 20 years or something. Last time we were at Ada, Ohio, I think that uh, Pastor Drake was, I probably, you know, kind of patted him on the head and, <laughs> and uh, you know, and I'm just like, all of a sudden, I'm really starting to feel old. <laughs> it's kind of strange. But I'm, I'm like, wow, I'm really pleasantly surprised. Uh, your pastor has got, besides just having personality, uh, he's got character, and besides the character, uh, he's got the earmarks. You can tell by some of the things that he says, I believe he's got the call of God on his life, which isn't always evident. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you're like, you know, I'll try this, and it's like, no, I don't think you should. <laughs> but um, I'm thrilled to see God sending men up into the Northwest, and this is where the Lord kind of led me through Brother DeMichael, uh, to come up here and to try to raise support back in 2004. And so we're back trying to, um, you know, uh, update the saints and, and um, trying to enjoy the trip as we go. So Lord, will, Lord willing, we're going to go to Cody, Wyoming tomorrow, and I want to finally get into that gun museum <laughs> that I didn't get to see back in 2004. So uh, looking forward to having, making some memories with our kids. And, and uh, so anyway, if... Um, that's pretty much it. I'll go ahead and ask the family to come up.
your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin. Every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your blood-stained brow. This the power of the cross, Christ became sin for us, took the blame, for the wrath we stand forgiven at the Buckeye State, and I know that there's a use for those things, it just, I don't know really what. <laughs> so they call them good-for-nothing nuts, and um, anyway, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I was raised in, uh, and it was under the influence of a large Baptist church. It was a BBF church. It was called a Baptist Bible Fellowship Church. Um, my pastor was uh, John Rawlings, and we averaged, whenever I was there, about 2,500 people every Sunday. Back in the heyday, 60s and 70s, they could pack that auditorium of about 4,000 people. And so it was a very large church, a very busy church, had lots of, you know, workers and lots of turnover. And most of the time, the message was all, it was the uh, saved, sure, and serving messages every Sunday. And the idea of, you know, kind of the methodology behind the ministry was win them, wet them, and work them. <laughs> you know, that was that kind of a thing. And um, <clears throat> the church itself, I believe, is over 200 years old. And as a little boy, I was put on a bus by my parents. But my parents were saved but not serving the Lord. And I got saved at the age of eight years old in a Sunday school class. And I remember the Lord dealing with me about preaching also around that time. And then as a result of uh, divorce in the family and being tossed back and forth and the alcoholism, my, my parents were very much part of the hippie generation, along with my uncles and my aunts and the wild parties and all that stuff that I was raised with. Um, you know, it's hard to combat uh, just a half an hour Bible lesson once a week with a life at home that's full of drinking and drugs and everything else that goes along with that whole um, rock and roll type of uh, you know, life, lifestyle. And so at the age of 11, I picked up a guitar and I just loved rock and roll music and went from rock and roll to 
heavy metal and went into thrash and then went kind of this that way and uh, by the age of 21 I didn't know if I was ever saved I didn't know if I was saved or lost it I didn't I, I didn't know I was very confused very wicked um, come to find out I was just very very backslidden didn't grow much you won't grow much in a saved you know sure and serving messages every week and um, but I did enough sinning to really definitely deserve hell that's for sure and uh, I just remember the times when the, whenever I was sober and the music was off and when that still small voice would show up the Lord would knock and say you had enough yet son you ready to come home and um, it got worse every time I said no it just got worse and so I spent seven years in the hog pen and then at 21 uh, Dr. Ruckman was one of the few pastors that I ever really respected I saw a lot of guys that just reminded me of just car salesmen, you know, and I just, uh, but Dr. Ruckman seemed to be real, and that's one thing that I really appreciated about him, so I went to go listen to him. Anyway, long story short, I got right with the Lord. The Lord reminded me of that call to preach, and then I surrendered my life. I, I come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is a man that is worth giving up every dream, every plan, everything that you've ever had as a human being and you can follow him and your life will mean something amen. Amen. amen i believe that he is deserving of every bit of love every bit of adoration affection i believe that jesus christ is worth uh following and uh he saved my soul as a beginning you know to, to start it all out with he forgave all of my sins and i blessed god you know i blessed the day that i actually understood the gospel and got that assurance of salvation so um then the Lord called me to be a missionary, and that's a different story. But I want to say this. When we come back to the States, I always ask the Lord for a message for Americans at this time. And I have a several messages that I've preached over the years, and those are what I call my America messages, my missions messages. i got hundreds of sermons, but these are the ones you're trying to kind of just seize the moment and try to get across something that the Lord gave you uh, and this morning, I, I'm changing gears a little bit simply because I've been preaching a couple of messages over and over again, and I know my family's sick of it, and I mean, I'm almost kind of sick of it myself. I mean, it's good stuff, I think. You know, like Brother said, you know, I, I enjoy my own water, but it's just, I mean, you know, if you start getting tired of it, you know your family's getting tired of it. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and preach something um, that's very old, actually. It's been a long time since I've preached this message. So turn to John chapter 17. And it's amazing when you step back and you look at the big picture of things, what the Lord's done in history. I heard uh, Bill Grady preach a message a couple of weeks ago, and he, he's also one of those big picture guys that can take, you know, 2,000 years of history and kind of bring in some little uh, details and events and ev dates and things like that and then kind of bring, uh, bring it all to, a, uh, to an apex and give you something. And yeah... I, we are living in an exciting time. The Lord's done something with the United States of America, and the question is why? And the answer to that, I believe, is that, you know, just looking at the way the Lord works, He chose, you know, He, was dis he discriminated. <laughs> he was a racist, as the modern wor world would say, and He chose one man and one race. And He doesn't do that because He's you know, not paying attention to the others. He does that for a reason. He did that, that through Abraham, all the nations would be blessed. That's the way the Lord works. The Lord works, He chooses maybe one man or a church or a race or whatever, and it's not just because all the others are excluded, it's just that He chooses to work through that first in order that He may bless all. Okay? And so I think that America, if you were to understand your identity in the world as a country and as a nation, with all the other nations, I mean, come on, America stands out, okay? She really does. I think she is exceptional, and I, I think that communism stinks. You know, God's not a communist. He's just not, all right? And whenever I say that, I love to say that in big crowds, and we get those old people, and they always kind of just, you just kick their gods a little bit, and they get a little bit... 
um, <laughs> tweaky. <laughs> but he's not. He doesn't give to everybody exactly the same. All right? You've got an issue with that. You can take it up with him. But uh, the Lord has done some things in the United States of America, and I think the reason is, is for the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, I just haven't been ever. Nobody from Israel ever came up to me and gave me a tract. Right? Nobody from Mexico came to me and gave me a tract. I haven't had a Canadian give me a tract. Have you? Who gave you a tract? A gospel tract. Chances are it was an American. And that didn't happen by accident. Okay? And so the Lord has blessed us, and He's blessed us for a reason. And the reason is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The power of the cross. And so, John chapter 17, let's read a couple of verses and then we'll pray. And um, John chapter 17 and verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify Thy Son, that Thy Son also may glorify Thee. As Thou hast given Him power over all flesh, that He should give eternal life to as many as Thou hast given Him. And this is life eternal. You want the definition of eternal life? You want to know what it really means? Here it is. That they might know Thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom Thou hast sent. It's going to take an entire eternity to get to know God because there's no end to it. Amen? I have glorified Thee on the earth. I have finished the work which Thou gavest me to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank You. Lord, that we can, uh, we don't need the emotions and the feelings, but already, Lord, it just seems like You've manifested Your presence. And we would so rather see You and hear from You. And Lord, it's a mystery to me still to this day why You choose uh, to work the way You do through men. And Lord, um, uh, we're just flesh and we're just a conduit. Lord, I just pray that you'd just cleanse me, that you'd use me, that you'd fill me with your spirit, that you'd speak to your people. Lord, that we might be uh, drawn to you and that you might have the preeminence and get the, the glory and the worship and the praise and your way in us and through us, Lord. I pray that you would just bless this message and may it do what you'd have it to do this morning in us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to call you, I would like to call your attention to verse 4 where he says at the end of the verse, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now this prayer is prayed uh, before he goes to Gethsemane. This is this finishing prayer after he has, uh, he began with the Passover feast with his disciples. Already Judas has left, already the questions have been asked, he's already given them all of the, uh, that, um, what they call that um, sermon that's in the upper room. And John chapters 14, 15, and 16 of all of that has already taken place. And right now, they're, I guess they're getting ready to sing the hymn before they go out and to the Garden of Gethsemane. And here he is uh, wrapping things up, and he prays a very, very uh, important prayer. This is really the Lord's Prayer. And if you will, the last words of a man, you know, before he of course, gives his life for us. The last words, the last will and testament of a man really mean something. And so I think the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ comes through and it shines through in this prayer and it's very personal, it's very emotional, if you will, and a few things kind of stand out. Now, if you want to know the Lord and if you want to obey the Lord and if you want your life to count something for, for you know, God's will, then uh, I think you should pay attention to this prayer. You can spend a lot of time in John chapter 17. And uh, he says this, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, he hasn't yet died on Calvary. He hasn't yet you know, risen from the dead. And so that kind of seems like a contradiction. Didn't he say that the reason why he came was to give his life a ransom for many? Isn't that what he said? That that was his, uh, the main thing you know, of his work and will, the will of, of the Father for him? He's not gone to Calvary yet, and so here, whenever he says, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, he's being very specific in, in regards to the twelve. Okay, he's finishing up his work with the twelve as far as up to that point, 
And his prayer is really interesting. And he, whenever he says, I have finished, it's past tense. And so a few things stand out in this passage that are past tense, and you can kind of sum up the Lord's ministry with the twelve. And it begins with verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Okay, past tense. This is something that he accomplished. That's what he meant whenever he said, I have finished the work. Does that make sense? I was a little bit nervous about preaching this message because it's gonna, there's going to be Bible. I'm really concerned about the kids. <laughs> and I've got other messages that I preach that are very animated and I run all over the place and stuff like that and scream and yell and, you know. But anyway, so we're going to try to get a little bit deep. Pay attention to the words. I have finished the work. And he says, I have manifested thy name. It's not that they had a question about the name Jehovah. It's what stands behind the name. And part of missions, part of ministry, being a pastor, preacher, evangelist, whatever, is you have to break down that freak that people build up in their hearts and minds that they call God. Okay? Now, now Jehovah is not Allah. All right? Amen. Different. It's not, uh, you know, it's, he's not Joseph Smith. He's not um, Mor Moroni. Amen? His name is Jehovah. Yeah. And then whenever God wanted to uh, get the message out to the rest of the Gentile world, he used Greek. Okay? And when he used Greek, he translated that name means Jehovah saves. His name is Jesus Christ. All right? Amen. So... I have manifested thy name, and so you have to show people who God really is because they watch television, and they're on the internet, and they build up this freak of who God is, and you've got to break that down for them to really know Him. That's the first part of the work. Verse 8, he says, For I have, I have, notice past tense, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me. Next very important part of ministry other than trying to live a life that's pleasing to God so that people might see in us, because we're the only Bible a lot of people see, is you have to give them the words of God. Past tense, I have. And then verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And so you, he what? Manifested the Lord to them. He declared his name to them. Gave him his words. And then he sent them out. That's missions in a nutshell. That's missions in a nutshell. That's what takes place in a local church like this. And if I know a pastor's heart, I think he would be thrilled that through the result of his just living in Billings and preaching and showing up at church when others don't, amen, <laughs> putting up with all the problems and the plumbing and the electricity and the broken down cars and you're just trying to preach and, and, and show people the Word of God and give people, uh, pray for people and stuff like that as if they grow in the Lord and then finally get to the point where they go. Um, we got pictures and videos this past week of our church there in Ukraine and they just got together about, I don't know, 10 of them and they just went out into all these other towns and villages that don't have a preacher and they just, that they've made it these last two weeks. It's all about evangelism and reaching out and seeing, trying to reach people with the gospel, people who have never heard, people that don't have a preacher, and that's what they did with their time. And I tell you what, it makes everything that we went through worth it. It really does. So missions is about a message, and the message, of course, is the gospel. Paul said something in Colossians where he said, Pretty much the gist of it in chapter 1 is that the message reached every creature under heaven. I'm like, how did they do that? You know, with no telephones and televisions and tele-whatever, you know, how did they do that? And I think that there is just a couple of things in this prayer that we absolutely have to have and understand if we're really going to obey the Lord in this big, big enterprise that we call the gospel ministry, missions, whether it's here or whether it's abroad. And the first thing I'd like to give you is found in verse 20. We'll start in verse 20. From verse 20, he starts praying for us. Up to verse 20, he's praying for the 12. And here he goes off and he starts praying for us. He says, Neither 
pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now, did you believe? Okay, he's praying for you. All right, let's look at what he's praying. That they may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. There's missions. It's almost like what the pastor said this morning, what the Lord used to call him, that people may know. God's very interested in people knowing that Jesus Christ died for them. Amen? He really is. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know, there it is again, that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Now, the end of verse 23 is an amazing verse to me. And most Baptists don't believe that. All right? Do you believe, it says, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me? Do you believe God loves you like he loves his only begotten son? Do you believe that? Most don't. You know that God loves you, right? But has to, and he says, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. That little word as is a pretty important word. Okay, I think the first thing that we have to understand is the, you have to have a proper understanding of the love of God. You have to have the fear of God. Fear of God's important. But you, gotta have the, you have to have the right kind of fear. You can always tell the kids that come from a family where, you know, maybe it's just a little bit heavy-handed. Because the kids respect Dad. The kids probably love Dad, but the kids are scared to death. You know, and they're, they're terrified, and you should be, and <laughs> keep you out of trouble. <laughs> That's good. But whenever you get a situation where there's no hugging, there's no contact, there's no real love and, and nurturing, whenever it's all this, you know, you know, mm, mom and dad probably don't understand real well about how to nurture. Amen. There needs to be both sides. There needs to be the fear of God that, oh, yeah, he's going to strike me dead. <laughs> but you need, the, the other fear is the real biblical fear. It's the fear of disappointing him. You know, it's the fear of, I don't, I love his smile so much that I don't want his frown. And there's just so much power in a smile, you know. It took me a while to figure it out. As they say in, in Ukraine, uh, the first uh, pancake never turns out. You know, my, my firstborn son's a little bit rough. And, you know, he, he, it took me a while to figure it out. I blame myself a lot. I carry a lot of guilt with all of that. But, uh, but boy, I figured it out a little bit later with the power of a smile. You know, just smiling at a kid and, and they just always smiling at them. And man, whenever, you, whenever they just look at you and you smile at them and they just kind of smile back and they're just... All oh, their eyes are so wide with wonder and love and affection and everything. And they look up and they're like, yeah. And then whenever you are disappointed and you frown at them and they're just so, ah, you know, it's just, I remember <laughs> little Christopher over there. He was just a little guy and, and he was, I just kind of scrunched up my face like a prune and I did it on purpose real hard. Just, ah, you know, and he was just like, daddy, smile. <laughs> you know, he just wanted daddy to smile at him. And that's the way it ought to be with the Lord. You need to understand that, yeah. The Lord loves you. And the reason that's important is because 1 John chapter 4 says, We love God because He first loved us. And we get it the other way around. We get to thinking that the Lord will love you, us, I've thought this, if I do this and if I do that, and we get our checklists. And, it, you know, it was automatic when I first got saved. Amen. First got saved, and it was all, oh, man, I love the Lord, and he loved, I knew He loved me, and it was like it was wonderful. And I started listening to preaching, and it was like, oh, I, was, I wanted it. I want to learn. Man, I was just a sponge. Tell me what I need to do. 
Amen? And then they were like, oh, you need to read this much of the Bible every day. And you need to read only in the morning, you know? And then you need to maybe pray. And then you've got to pray not just once a day, but three times a day, you know, facing, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know? I don't know, Pensacola, Jerusalem, whatever. I'm, that's, that didn't mean, that's not a slight. I'm just saying, you know how people get, okay? And, and, and through time, I began to just get these lists. And it was literally humanly impossible to live up to every preacher's expectation. And then I began to kind of let it drop here. And sometimes I'd be like, okay, yeah, I read the Bible through, you know, in three months and tried to do it you know, a few times. I've never attained to reading it through once through in a month. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but at the same time, it takes meditation. As far as I understand, Psalm 1 is talking about meditating in the Word of God. And sometimes that means that my time is going to be spent in one or two verses or one chapter versus reading, you know, your 15 chapters of the day or six or three or whatever you do. I'm all for boundaries and schedules and methodology. But when it gets so ritualistic, it becomes empty and it just becomes checking things off on a list. You've missed it. Okay, whenever just reading it, oh, I got to get my Bible reading in, and you're not listening. It's not how many times you go through the Bible, it's how many times the Bible goes through you. Amen. All right? And so you just get to these checklists, checklist Christianity, and you begin to lose the relationship. And then when you don't live up, it's like, it's like David trying to fight Goliath with Saul's armor. I haven't proved it. That's not me. Amen? I can't go out, I can't function as a missionary and keep up with your Bible reading schedule. <laughs> you know, teaching in a Bible institute, yeah, there were some times I got to the point where it's like, look, I don't want to hate the Bible. <laughs> okay? I don't want to resent it. I love the Word of God. You get me right. But man, if that's all you do, you know, and so don't try to judge and don't criticize and don't try to put your armor on other people. We have to have our own relationship with Jesus Christ Amen. and learn that, yeah, maybe I don't live up with all of these things, but look, He loves me. Amen. We love God because He first loved us. I'm going to stop right there and just kind of keep on going. There's more in that. And then we'll get on with what Pastor was talking about this morning. Verse 26. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So not only, I think, do people, Christians, they get these guilt complexes, they can't live up to every other person's idea of what it means to be a Christian or a follower of Jesus Christ. They become under that self-imposed condemnation and the self-loathing begins. And you get discouraged and they quit. Right? We see it all over the country. They quit. And not only that, I think the other thing that causes Christians to quit is just no love with the brethren. I think number two, this is an important message, this is an important part of the message tonight or today, is love for the brethren. First, understanding the love of God towards you, then how you need to love the body of Christ. Amen. I was kind of happy whenever he said that. I thought, okay, well, yeah. he hasn't heard a preacher preach. He's going to pre hear it this morning. <laughs> Pastor's going to hear it this morning. I preach this stuff all the time in Ukraine because we live in a society where it's like here, you guys build like this. You know, and there, they build on top of each other. It's literally Isaiah 5. They join house to house and field to field. Nobody can be alone. I mean, literally, the government controls all the farmland. They divvy up a little bit of a piece, you know, a couple hectares of land for people's personal gardens. And it's like one big field, you know, say about 10 acres, okay, 10 acres of land, and you've probably got 20 people or so that get to work those 10 acres. And they join field to field. And I mean, you, can you imagine the disappointment of planting a garden, all of the work, you know, the hoeing, 
And then on harvest day, somebody got there before you. And you're dependent on that for your family. It makes you mad. It makes you mean. And people in Ukraine, communism just stinks. It breaks our hearts to see the path that America's taken right now. Uh, you guys better, you know, you guys have a much better chance of surviving. These big cities, if something happens, if the economy collapses here like it did over there, it is going to be a bloodbath here. Yeah. I've often looked at the people in Ukraine, and I, the one thing they didn't have is they didn't have guns. They were one of the most armed countries in the world before communism. And it was probably a good thing that they weren't armed whenever the collapse came. Because have you ever seen two like 70 year old women duke it out in the marketplace? I've seen that. <laughs> like, you know, people are just on edge all the time. Nobody cares about, nobody has any consideration. You, you know, Americans are really, really, they're, 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 they're very conscientious about space. You know, over there, I mean, it's like the armpits in your face on the public, you know, transportation. Back before, when, you know, women used to shave. They, they shave now, but they didn't then. And I was like, wow, I've never seen that before. <laughs> never smelled that before either. <laughs> you know, it's just communism and socialism. It's just rough stuff, and everybody's mean and angry and mad. And then you get, and they get saved, and then still they got all this baggage. And they have to learn how to love one another. And so I preach on it a lot. And it finally took root. We finally had a revival. And um, we have checklists, not only with the Lord, but we've got them with the brethren too, don't we? I heard a friend of mine once, he summed it up really, really well. He said, you know what, brother? I come to the conclusion, all these stuff that the brethren have with each other, you know what it really is? I was like, no, what is it? What is it, what is it really? He says, all it is, and it just gives people an excuse not to love each other. Mm -hmm. You know what? That's pretty spot on. I'm going to give you something. Um, this is just something that I think makes sense. It might not be right, but it uh, helped me understand 1 Corinthians 13. Now, I know that we're Bible believers, and we got all the adjectives in front of that, you know, dispensational, premillennial, separated, you know, missions, da da da, whatever I've left out. Um, and we don't talk about love a whole lot. Of course, you've got to be you know, hard because the other people are talking about love all the time. <laughs> it drives me nuts. Um, but yeah, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And here he said, you know, for a long time I never would preach, really preach out of this chapter because I didn't understand it. I just don't think you should preach above your experience level, you know. You should teach and preach, you know. Sometimes you're called on preaching something that you don't understand what it is. And you do it simply because it's right. It's kind of like somebody, you know, who's single preaching on marriage. <laughs> or somebody that doesn't have kids telling others how to raise their kids, you know. But the Apostle Paul was inspired. <laughs> okay. But you're not the Apostle Paul. All right? So, you know, anyway, I've had guys try to do that, and it's just, it doesn't go across very well. So 1 Corinthians 13, you try not to preach above your experience level. And he says in verse uh, 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. So knowing, knowledge. Okay, it's got limitations and prophesy in part. Okay, it also, it can only take you so far. Prophesying here is kind of like a synonym for preaching. We know it has a futuristic foretelling the future, but also the Bible word for prophesying means to preach. You're declaring God's word, whether it's today or next week or next year or whatever. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now that, we, we debated that and we discuss this and trying to figure out what is that when that which is perfect has come. Now that was the verse that just took forever to really try to understand. Because, you know, some say, well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ and it's the second coming. And okay, in, in, in the light of verse 12, I would say, okay, yeah, it fits. 
Some say, well, it's the word of God. And you say, okay, well, again, it was in completed canon. The Holy Spirit was still working through the 12 or through the other uh, uh, apostles. And so, yeah, maybe it was in part. And then, uh, but then again, it still doesn't quite match or fit. He says, but when that which is perfect is come, then, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, he already told you what is in part. Okay, he told you that it's, we know in part knowledge. Now, there are some things that surpass knowledge. Okay, and we prophesy in part. There's some things that surpass the ability to say the right things at the right time. I have sat in people's living rooms and in their kitchens or in the church office and they've come and asked for counseling and I have absolutely sat dumbfounded with the how complex and how terrible the situation was or, or the suffering or the despair or and people in need of comfort and, and I really don't know what to say to fix it. I'm like, I, I didn't learn about this in Bible Institute and I can't really recall one verse that would just make it all better. <laughs> you know? Because knowledge... Words, Amen. they only go so far. And when you don't know what to say, you just love people. I think that that which is perfect has come. Scripture with Scripture and other passages that Paul preached, he's talking about Christian maturity. Okay? Perfection is in the sense of completion. When that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. There it is, the words. I understood as a child, there it is, the knowledge. But, and I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. You don't have to be the most important guy in the room. You don't have to always be the guy that knows what to say at the right time. Sometimes you just have to shut your mouth and weep with people and say, you know what I found that actually work wonders? It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. The Lord's on the throne. He knows you. He hears you. It's going to be okay. And, but, but you don't understand. But, but my, my husband did this, and my husband did that, and my kids, and we don't have any money. And, I, and I'm like, it's going to be okay. My husband's drinking again. I don't know. What to, and, you know and I've got verses. I've got all these things. I can go into a discourse. And sometimes, you know what? The Lord knows it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And they begin to calm down. And it's going to be okay. Amen. The perfect man. Look at uh, Ephesians chapter 4 quickly. Paul, when he preached, he talked about that perfect man, when that which is perfect. It's come, of course, it's Jesus Christ, but he's talking about perfection. And it's in the passage on charity. Charity just simply wanting to do others good. You're putting everybody in a better light and, a, and a giving everybody the benefit of the doubt, and you really seek someone else's good. That's what it means to love them. You want them to be, to be comfortable. You want them to, be, to do well. You want them to prosper. You want God to bless them. That's what it means. And again... We've received what we've received as Americans so that we can love others. Okay? Abraham, he blessed Abraham so that others would be blessed. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 10. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers... For the perfecting, there's the word perfect, of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, that the Lord Jesus Christ prayed, you know, prayed that, that we all might be one, and, that not, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, again, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about that they might know thee, know thee the only true God, unto a perfect man, you see that? There's that word perfect again, it keeps popping up, unto the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. All right, and so that's the perfect man is when we become like Christ. When that which is perfect is come. 
Christian perfection, I believe. You get to the point where you, speaking the truth in verse 15, speaking the truth in love, may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. There's the word love. Look at Colossians quickly. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14. And above all these things put on charity. There's the word charity, which is the bond of what? Perfectness. When that which is perfect is come unto the perfect man. He's talking about Christian perfection and it's personified, or, or not personified, it is the bond of it, the seal of it, the, the outstanding mark of Christian perfection is love for the brethren. That's all I really want to say this morning <laughs> in that point. Okay, that's really it. And I finally came to the point where the Lord's Supper actually made sense. How many times have you just kind of like, okay, it's talking about not having any unconfessed sin in your life, which that ought to be true of every day of your life. Amen? Amen. So what does this mean to eat and drink unworthily, to not discerning the Lord's body? Finally came, it finally dawned on me what the Lord was showing the twelve whenever He instituted the Lord's Supper there in the upper room, He washed their feet. He says, you understand what I've done unto you? And pretty much in essence what He was saying is, hey boys, I'm leaving out of here. My physical body is no longer going to be with you, but on this earth is going to be my spiritual body. And you're going to prove your love to Him by how much you love them. Amen. And that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to judge yourself Amen. Do you live up to the, the, the example that Jesus Christ said? He washed their stinking dirty feet. He was the creator of the world. Yeah. And he's washing Peter's feet. Yeah. Thomas's feet. <laughs> if he will stoop and do that, if he will fellowship with you, how much, you know, who are you to, you know, to not fellowship with somebody because you don't like the shirt that they wear? If Jesus Christ will fellowship with them, well, then who are you? <laughs> now, I'm not talking about let's get rid of all distinctions and let's break down all the barriers. I'm not talking about church discipline. Okay? Uh, yes. People are living wicked. They're living sinful and they're a member of this church. Well, you withhold the one thing that is probably the most precious thing of the Christian life, and that's fellowship with the saints. All right? I'm not talking about that. Actually, you do that in love. Whenever the choice is given and you get to the crossroads, you pretty much say, to, hey, brother, I love you, but I love him more. And I, I don't want to be Laodicea where he's on the outside not going to get in. We want him here. The way you're living, you're quenching the spirit. And so if we have to choose who goes, guess who loses? <laughs> Amen. Amen. And that doesn't mean that you don't love them. Yeah. Actually, you're helping them. You're helping them understand that it's not okay with what you're doing. What you're doing is causing shame to the, the name and bringing shame on the, the work of God. So, yeah, the Lord's <laughs> Supper is all about charity. It's all about loving the brethren. And if you don't, well, then you judge yourself and you realize that, hey, you know, Peter ate and drank, right? He denied the Lord, and he was restored. That's what the Lord's Supper does. But Judas, he ate and drank. But he ate and drank damnation to himself. Denied the Lord. So, love for the brethren. Understanding the love of God, having love for the brethren. And then I'm going to wrap these last two points up real quick. Um, go back to John chapter 17, verse 21. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. That's talking about a unity that, that, that 
exists in the body of Christ. I really appreciate um, Pastor Haviman. He was just he, he was a preacher's kid, and uh, he went up to our kids, and we're traveling with our family. And I meant to say something. Um, wanted to put this out publicly. Thank you to the pastor and to his wife, and thank you to Curtis and Tijuana Francis because I was getting tweaky, kind of. I've been trusting the Lord all these years, but you still have those. I'm looking out west, and I'm like, I'm going to have my family in a van, and I don't know how we're going to get from Sunday to Sunday or how we're going to live, and I really appreciate you guys putting us up. You took a huge load off. I mean, I had plan B, plan C. I was just told my wife, honey, if it starts, I'm not going to go into debt <laughs> trying to do what God called us to do. And I was looking at prices and this and that and the other, and I just thank God. You guys were a godsend. I mean, just praise the Lord for you. May God bless you and give you a hundredfold for what you did for us. Amen. But there's this unity of purpose that we're all in this. The body, I appreciate Brother Haviman because he's, he just, he's a preacher's kid. He gave my kids, you know, a couple bucks. You know, usually get a love offering or something, but he went to my kids. He said, here, here's something for you. He said, I want your kids to know. You know, your kids being preacher's kids are going to see a lot. They were going to see the best in Christians, and they're going to see the worst in Christians. He says, I just really want your kids to know God's people are the best. They really are. And American Christians, wow. Wow. How many of you were raised in a Christian home? Would you raise your hand? How many of you, your parents were raised in a Christian home? Wow. How many of you, your parents, your grandparents were raised in a Christian home? Any of you never get that in Ukraine. I asked the question, how many of you were raised in a Christian home? And it might be one or two hands. How many of you, your parents, were raised in a Christian home? Hardly ever. We're dealing with first-generation Christians. The second-generation Christians are rare. And the effects of the Word of God on this society, to me, is amazing. It's a blessing. You know, I don't think you should... Exchange your culture, amen, no matter what Hollywood says or the news media. So, a unity of purpose, um, I think it's essential. Our church finally, finally caught the vision. And there's this unity that exists in the body of Christ or in, in our church. Um, I believe in both local and the body of Christ, just so you guys know. <laughs> um, they finally got it. it. Takes years. We had to understand something as a missionary. I'd read the missionary books, and oh yeah, you're supposed to. Once your feet hit the ground, you're supposed to plant the church. And by the time you're you're done, because the apostle Paul, I mean, he was in Thessalonica for three weeks, right? And since so Paul could plant a church in three weeks, so should you. <laughs> oh my goodness, it's too much. Uh, anyway. So we had these crazy ideas, and it just it takes years. We come, come to find out, if it comes, when it comes to leadership and training pastors and things, it, you're really going to have to wait for the second generation guys to mature. Just, just the way it is on our mission field. Now, it might be different somewhere else, but that's what we found. And then I'd like to just kind of sum it up and finish up with verse 24. We've really run out of time. Verse 24, Father, I will that... They also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. The Lord's kind of like, I just wish they could see it. I wish they could just see me in my glory. I'm looking forward to it. That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And so... We need a fresh glimpse of eternity. One day we're going to be with Him. One day, the sum total of our lives and how much we gave to God, how much we kept for ourselves is all going to be put in the fire. It's all going to be tried. 
And I know I already have regrets. I already have regrets. And I know I'm going to have more regrets then. I mean, I know these things. But I don't want it to, to dis detract from just, the Lord says, gird up the loins of your mind. He's just saying, you know what? Heaven is going to blow your mind. <laughs> You better gird up the loins. You better get ready because it's going to be like, woo! <laughs> wow! I remember there, those first couple of years, there was no McDonald's arches. There were no billboards. There was no private companies, no advertisements. There was no color. It was just gray. The streets were gray. The sky was gray. The people wore black and gray. The walls were gray. Everything was gray. There was no color. And I remember the first time, I mean, I felt like I was going insane because I looked like an insane guy. I went outside, and I saw the first blade of grass coming through the asphalt. And I picked it up, and it was just beautiful. I was just kind of standing there. <laughs> wow. And for my eyes to kind of feast on color, I would get, you know, those CDs. I would kind of put it in the light, and I would just be like, this is what heaven's going to be like. <laughs> this John said it's, you know, he's got the emerald, the green, and he's describing color. He's like, wow, if you could just see it. I think if we could just see it. And he says we, we get a little bit of that in church and in music every once in a while. When the Spirit of God moves across the, the strings of our heart, and he says he reveals to us the deeper things of God. There's just people sing about heaven, sing about the Lord's glory, and there's just something in there. It's just like, oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's what you have to have if you're going to keep on going for the Lord. It's all going to be worth it. Every sacrifice, every cross born, every time you denied yourself, this present day, you know, the universities know thyself, you know, the existentialists, you know, express thyself, you know, just be yourself, which is the worst advice to give somebody sometimes, you know, <laughs> be yourself. Please don't. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Be like Christ, okay? But all that stuff, he's, and Christ taught, deny thyself. And he's keeping books. He's writing it all down, folks. And you're going to be so glad you did. Four things that I think we need is a fresh glimpse of eternity, love for the brethren, unity, purpose in the church, and understanding the love of God. If we've got that, I think we can get some things done. We can get the gospel out. And I think the Lord is very, very concerned about getting the story of why Jesus Christ came, why he went to the cross, lived the way he lived, and rose from the dead. This world needs that message. And when the, when the body of Christ doesn't have those things, then the purpose and the power and, and, and all these things about the message, it gets distracted and it gets you know, tainted, if you will. It's not the message, it's us. It's the conduit through which the message is preached. I think that those are some things that are very important, and I pray it was a blessing to you. Thank you for your time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and I'll turn it over to the pastor. Lord, thank you for liberty. Thank you, Lord, for just uh, having an opportunity to meet together and to uh, think about you, think about your love for us and what you did and um, what you expect from us. And Lord, help us just to find that joy, that have that joy the Lord, find that joy and, and strength in serving others in your name. And Lord, I just pray you'll bless this church and the pastor, bless the message and this day for Jesus' sake. and preaching over the last month. I don't know if you all caught it, but I caught a lot of it. <laughs> I wrote the notes, though, so maybe I remember better. I didn't see all the hands go up. How many of you are second generation? Your parent, you grew up in a Christian home. Second generation. Oh, that, is a, that is a mess. That's a mess of people. I don't get bad messages.
I mean, like a mess, too. <laughs> a lot. Yeah. Good stuff. My old preacher told me he was talking to a... Uh, bring the water up here. I'm just going to stall for a second. He was talking to a missionary. And this missionary, he's, he's dead now, but he got saved out of the hippie generation. His wife was a hippie. He was a hippie. They got saved, went down to Bible school. He got called to preach, called to the mission field, went to South Africa. My preacher was talking to him and said, did you ever think when you got saved that you'd ever be able to do anything like this for the Lord? He said, no, I got saved out of drugs. I got saved out of a mess. So I was just, <clears throat> I was just glad that the Lord would use me for anything. I didn't have aspirations to build a big work or become some famous name in the body of Christ for the Lord. I said his name, probably five of you in this room didn't know who he, is, who he was. And he said, same for me. He said, I got saved out of a cocaine addiction. Uh, co dealing cocaine got sent to, to, to the judge. The judge said, you can go to prison. You can go to the military. You can go to this thing, this thing called the Reclamation Ranch down in Texas. He took the obvious choice on that one. He ended up getting saved there. Didn't build a big work. If I said his name... You'd only know his name because because he was my pastor, and uh, it's kind of the exception to the rule to see a first generation Christian take off, serve the Lord, and and build something, build a big work. And if I talk to you about your parents' home. There would be holdovers from the world, from what they came out of, right? They came out of a I'm about one third into what I wanted to say. I thought it'd take two minutes, but we'll get there. Just bear with me. Your second gen, your parents came out of some rough stuff. <clears throat> and what they did, you, tell me one thing that, about David, Jesse's father. One thing about his personality, his character, what he amounted to in life. You could dig real deep and come up with a lot of speculation. And do a whole lot. You know everything about David. David's kind of a first generation kind of guy. I don't think his parents are bad folks, but we don't know nothing about him. David's kind of a first generation. And he went out there and just because it was the right thing to do. He didn't have any better sense. He went out there and killed Goliath with a with a stone and a strip of leather. I've done this a couple times. I'll go fight a lion barehanded. I got nothing else going on. Lord protect me. If he doesn't, he doesn't. Like the plumbers say when they're hanging pipe in the commercial building, it'll hold till it doesn't. <laughs> you build it to what it says, it'll hold till it doesn't. They went out there, killed that Goliath. Your second generation, Solomon didn't have to kill any Goliath. They were already all dead. David killed four of his brothers before it was over with. They had four brothers, three at least, four probably. Solomon didn't have to do that. What did Solomon do? God expected Solomon to take what David built and then continue without all the baggage, right? And do a great work. And he did a great work. But the greatest temptation for Solomon was having too much ease, having too much handed to him. Easy come, easy go. Solomon had a lot handed to him, and to whom much is given, much shall be required. So that's to both of you. First generation, you have something to set for the second generation. Say, the Lord's coming back in 2030 or 2033 or 2035. You don't know that. You got something to build for the second generation. <clears throat> you second generation people, 
you have had a foundation laid for you, and your temptation is since you didn't have to fight the Goliath, and you didn't have to go to the Lord and get daily in prayer and kill the lion and kill the bear, because your parents already killed all them for you, and they got their problems. David had his problems. Boy, we could fill the whiteboard with David's problems. He had a mess of problems. You know what you got? You don't have David's problems. It was really good foundation that maybe you just need to get some concrete caulk out and fix the cracks. <laughs> you got a really good foundation, you just need to patch a couple corners here and there and get some rebar set so you can build on top of that and get your walls and get out of the ground and get something established for the Lord. You're ahead. So that preacher that I mentioned and his missionary that he had this conversation with, they got ahead for their kids and their kids have something established today that they never would have had at that we were working on the job site one time. Beth was pregnant with Abby. My friend was pregnant with his first kid. He bought a house, it was out of level, it was gonna be a fix and repair thing. I'm working on a house, working on buying a piece of property. We're 23 and 21 at the time. He comes to work one morning, we get, we're working in the rain doing flashing on the siding so we can get the siding on this house. And he says, I'm about to buy a house. I'm married. I got a kid on the way. How stinking 30 years old is that? <laughs> We're ahead. That's why. And it's established and it's right. Some of you don't, you don't even know what I'm saying, some of you. You're 20 years old, you're like, you're set. You got it all set up. By the time you're 30, you don't have to make all the mistakes temptation is whether you're going to continue for the Lord and use that foundation or whether you're going to squander it like Solomon did in the end. Many outlandish women, outside the land women, caused him to sin, bringing in idolatry right next to the temple. How could that happen? <laughs> he had too much handed to him. He didn't have to stay close to the Lord because he just didn't have to because it was all ready in place. Well, that's a lot of good stuff today. I hope you got time to absorb it. I hope uh, you don't try to get all of it. Just get what the Lord gave to you today. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed. I think we went long enough. We don't have to have a closing invitation. But, uh, oh, Brother Curtis, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Well, we just thank you for today. We're all good. Amen. All right. Have a good afternoon.